Hey guys, welcome back to Sex and Violence with Rebel Girl, the show where we interview high-level MMA fighters and other experts in their fields about love, dating, romance, and that very taboo subject, sex. I'm your host, Ashley Rebel Girl, Evan Smith. Now let's talk about sex and violence. What is up, all my naughty listeners, I guess I should say, and viewers now. We are officially on video, so if you are listening on the Spotify, Apple, whatever app you're listening to, there is a full video version, and you can check that out on our YouTube page. Always those links will be in the show notes, so check those out. All right, this is the part of the show where I give you an update with my life. And, you know, I've just been buckling down on yoga, podcasting, and all these other little things. And I'm at this point where I have so much good news to tell you, but until the ink is dry, I can't say anything. So uh, I should have some really great news for you next week. Proud of us for switching over to video. Um, You know, we're going to be constantly probably switching sets and working out some things off and on. So bear with us. And over the weekend, I actually got a new uh, CBD sponsor. So they will probably, you'll probably hear a new ad in the very near future for True Hemp. And that's a CBD company. Uh, They're based out of Minnesota. Went out there over the weekend and uh, met Pete, the owner. And it's just a really, really great family environment. It was cold as balls, but we had a good time. They did a lunch party at the, uh, what's it called, a brewery, like Shooting Star Brewery in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, Mr. Anthony Smith was also um, at the event, and it was really fun to catch up with him. And that guy is doing big things. He's also you know, a UFC fighter, but he's an analyst. I think he's working on the UFC tonight. So he's like the post show on the desk. And then he's also doing like Sirius XM radio and some other, he has a podcast with Mike Bisping, like, you know, this show that you guys are about to see with Miranda Maverick. We talk about how fighters really need to focus on their life after fighting. And, you know, this guy, Anthony Lionheart Smith, He's killing it right now, so shout out to him. Uh, What else did I do this weekend? Look at my notes. I had a girls trip in Vegas, but it wasn't like, woo, crazy shenanigans. Um, Two of my girlfriends now live out there, and uh, I was going to have a photo shoot with Juan Cardenas, who is at De Somatas on Instagram. Really, really good boudoir and UFC photographer, so check him out. Um, He's having an art exhibit on May 6th from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. in Las Vegas. If you guys are going to be out there, check it out. I will be out there, so maybe I'll see you there. And then, actually, Juan helped me do some sexy, naughty pictures because I started a fan time site. If you guys want to check that out, it's basically an adult website with exclusive content. I know, sounds crazy. I, for you longtime listeners and now viewers, I kept saying that I would never do that only because I am lazy. But fan time has, they're just doing everything for me. They're they're helping with the photographers and the makeup and the location. Like fan time, check it out. If you're thinking about creating an exclusive content site, they really are great. Mine is www.ashleyrebelgirl.com. Subscribe like my pictures, do whatever. Uh, before we start, before we get talk about fights this weekend, I wanted to remind you, please, 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 it is a free way to help the show. Go rate us and review us on Apple iTunes. Spotify only has ratings, but if you can just shoot over to Apple iTunes, you know, hey, the show's good, the show sucks, whatever, it helps us move up in the charts. I'm not really sure what chart we are. I feel like we are sports, sex, comedy, what would you categorize us as, Zol? Oh, we are multi-genre. So go and give us a rating and review. It really helps us out. And it's fucking free 99. So please do that. Or if you would like to spend some money, please go to the website, sexviolencewithrebelgirl.com. Buy a piece of merch, a hat, shirt, coffee mug. It doesn't matter. Actually, I need to get a coffee mug (laughs) now. Um, um, But yeah, if you buy a piece of merch, we're doing a UFC, a signed UFC glove giveaway. So 
whenever you buy a piece of merch, your name is automatically entered into the drawing. If you buy two coffee mugs, you're double entered. So check that out. If you guys want to email us here at the show, it's sexandviolencepodcast at gmail.com. Whatever, you know, floats your boat. You want to give us a guest suggestion. You want to tell us what topics you would like to hear more about. Uh, You want to sponsor the show. Okay, guys, the UFC is back at the Apex in Las Vegas. This card is pretty awesome. We've got an intriguing matchup in the women's strawweight division. It's number 10 ranked contender Amanda Lemos, who attempts to spoil the return of former champ Jessica Andrade. And in UFC's UC Vegas 52 heavyweight co-main event, we have Chase Sherman stepping in last minute for Tanner Bozer, who I believe is out on injury, not COVID. You never know these days. And he's attempting to stop the undefeated up-and-comer Alexander Romanov. Rest of the card looks amazing. <laughs> the OG, we got Clay Guida taking on Claudio Poyes. Yep, DJ Zol says, bow, bow, bow. Uh, Clay is taking on Claudio. Claudio is a young, uh, uh, he's from Peru. I actually trained with him at Team Oyama. This guy is a killer, but it's like, oh no, it's Clay Guida. So uh, I, I don't know. That's a toss up right there. Macy Barber versus Montana De La Rosa in the flyweight division. We have Manel Cape versus Sue Majera. And then Charles Jordan versus Lando Venata. That's going to be a great one as well. This prelims card is pretty stacked. We got Preston Parsons versus TBA. I don't know why it says TBA. My bad, guys. <laughs> Mark Andraj Barult killed that one versus Jordan Wright. D- Dwight Grant versus Sergey Kondakov. Tyson Pedro versus Ike Villanueva. Cameron Else versus Auri Quilleg. Felipe Linz versus Marcin Pronchino and Dean Barry versus Mike Jackson. That's the lineup for tomorrow, guys. Check it out. <laughs> martial artist who competes in the flyweight division of the UFC. She previously competed in the flyweight division of Invicta FC, and this farm-raised fighter started grappling at just 16 years old. Now, at 24 years old, she holds a 10-4 and record. We talk about Wonder Woman aspirations, dating to marry, type A personality dating checklist, learning from others' dating mistakes, Tinder one and done, eloping on Thanksgiving, MMA over PhD, and much more. Here is your guest, Miranda Fear the Maverick. All right, we're here with Miranda Fear the Maverick. I'm super excited. Thank you for being on the show, girl. I'm really happy to be here. All right. So sex and violence. Let's jump right into the violence aspect. Do you have a fight coming up? If so, tell us what you can about it. Unfortunately, I don't have a fight coming up, but I've had a couple, you know, mishaps in the last couple of weeks. Um, I've been calling out Molly McCann, trying to fight her. I've kind of been told there's not really interest from that side to fight her, unfortunately. Um, And then I've also had a short notice fight offered to me that would have been April 30th against Courtney Casey, and she actually rejected me as an opponent. I don't even know if she's gotten another fill-in, so that's been an interesting one, too. I was of the mindset where maybe I should be the one on the card then, and she could be a fill-in for somebody, but that's how it goes. Wow. You know, I I really didn't even know that was an option to, you know, if your opponent falls out and they find you a replacement, I didn't know you could decline that re- replacement. I actually thought that in the contract – you kind of maybe need to go back and read our contracts, but I thought that if your opponent falls out, you can't really dispute whether or not you want to fight the new fill-in person, but maybe I'm wrong. And it seems like if I was in Courtney Casey's position, I would just be grateful that there was someone willing to step up. So all that hard work and sacrifice didn't go to waste, but yeah, I think so. You think you just want a paycheck at the end of the day, but at the same time, if you're already on the verge of thinking you might be cut or something along those lines, and you're worried about that opponent, I guess they think long term it might be the better decision for them. Yeah, and and there's two ways of going about your fight career, right? It's like that cowboy Cerrone, uh, Artem Lobov uh, mindset. We just had him on the show where it's like, I will fight anybody, anytime, anywhere. But then it, that's obviously not always the smartest if you maybe are climbing up the ranks and it's in this type of situation where it's a last minute fill in and you spent months and months for a grappler, but they're a badass striker. I totally get that. And I think I kind of have that 
personally have that meathead uh, fighter mentality of like, oh, you want to fucking fight? Let's fucking fight. You know, I don't care. You know, um, so maybe she's being smart. You know, I should be impartial here. We don't know the whole story, what she's got going on. <laughs> But in my head, I'm like, she's scared. She's afraid to fight you. Right, right, right. Well, that's how I feel too. But, you know, at the end of the day, I just wanted to fight and I wanted my paycheck. Um, and now I have to wait a little longer. But it's one of those things where you're always told you'll have to wait a few months. And, you know, I could be called tomorrow and have a fight in two weeks. I don't know. So I'm and staying ready. That's the, the beautiful and shitty thing about our sport, right? Where it's like, you got to stay on your toes. You got to stay ready. You know, you could, it could look like you're not going to fight for a while, like you said. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're on a card, you're making a paycheck. And a lot of fighters, uh, they think that short notice fights are a bad thing. But in my opinion, I haven't really taken too many. But it it helps me because I'm such I'm such a, a weirdo inside my head, over analyzing, overthinking, you know, just things that don't even matter. And it takes that away, it takes out of the equation, right? You don't have that time to stress out and overanalyze. So, do you prefer yeah, short notice exactly. fights? When you're, when you're leading up to eight week fights and all that, and you're in camp, it's always like, I wish the fight was just right now. When short notices, it basically is you're cutting weight and then you're in the cage. Next thing you know. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. also uh, an issue, probably why I don't take short notice fights because I'm a large woman and I need a lot of time to cut weight so <laughs> do you walk around kind of close to your weight class used to not so do you mind if I tell about the first time we were supposed to meet in the cage no I don't even this, know if... this is the point of the show yeah right. oh it's, it, and it's so relevant because Molly McCann was my opponent oh really I wasn't even sure about that I remember I got called and they were like do you want to fight Ashley and I was like I want to fight anybody you're giving me a four fight contract in the UFC awesome I will tell I'll tell let me tell the beginning of the story you tell the end yeah. okay, so perfect. March 2020 I think it was like 16 17 yeah. somewhere around there um I flew over to London to fight Molly McCann. Literally, me and Marvin Vittori, only fighters that flew over there because everyone was weirded out. It was like, oh no, the um, you know travel might be shut down any minute. But just like we were talking about earlier, I was like, anytime, anywhere, let's fight. I want to get paid. And we flew over there, spent less than 12 hours in London, and then got a phone call saying, travel bans are in place, come back to the U.S., so I come back to the U.S. I'm like munching down on my hummus wrap on the plane, just like, you know, just so hungry because I'm not a 25er, let's face it. And um, <laughs> then I land and I find out from my agent, like, hey, you just got to stay ready because they might have an opponent for you. Um, they don't know who. It might be on an Indian reservation. And then I find out that it's Miranda Maverick who... I had not heard of at this point. I'm like, let's fucking go. I don't know who this girl is. They're like, she's from Invicta. She's kind of shorter than you. I'm like, and I was already preparing for Molly, who's like five foot nothing. So um, it was going to happen. You and I were going to fight. And then just because Fight Island wasn't a thing yet and the world was fucking closing down, you and I didn't fight. And you continue the right. rest of the story. Yeah, basically it was the first card canceled from COVID. I think Tyrone Woodley was the head of the card, right? The main event. Um, and I was really excited because I had gotten several offers from the UFC in the past, but they were all like the one fight contract thing, or it'd be like three days notice. And I'm fairly big too, even though I'm short, but at the time I walked around at 145 and I like to think I was lean even then. Um, after I got in the UFC, I started leaning down and just staying leaner. Now I walk at about 140, 139 so that on a week and a half notice I can cut weight. Um, but at the time I was a little bit heavier. Um, but I remember I got called pretty short notice. I think it was like a nine days or something like that to fight you. And I was like, sure, let's, let's yeah. do it. But then that got canceled. I think my next one was against Mara Berea. And um, then, of course, I had something happen then, too, and got all the way to Vegas and couldn't fight because of medical issues that I didn't have any clue about. Yeah, it's it's so wild game, you know, and this is like a, a fun full circle situation that I'm in where I actually get to interview, you know, potential opponents, you know, because I, I'm not done fighting. Maybe let's face it, I'm probably never going to make flyweight again with these new titties and all this weight I've acquired over the time. But, um, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So uh, it's pretty cool now. And I wanted to ask you. Uh, even though you don't have a fight plan right now, who, you know, besides Molly McCann, who are you eyeing? Joanne Calderwood, I think, oh. that's, or Wood, I guess it is. Yeah. Um, I Wood. called her out as well. I kind of said, you know, Molly McCann is the girl that I want to fight the most on this hype. 
coming off of it. I don't think she deserves it. And I'm ready to kind of shut that train down. But uh, Joanne's the next one on my list of who I'd want to fight if I got the chance to fight who I wanted. And I do take a lot of short notice fights. My last two fights have been, you know, short notice. I've taken them. I lost the one again against Aaron Blanchfield. It was an off night for me. And then I beat Sabina Mazo this last time. And I'd like to have a fight that I got to pick, you know, instead of just being thrown in there last second and or used for what, what people want to say was uh, Macy's stepping stool, you know, even though I think I won that fight. Um, so yeah, Joanne Wood is the one that I'm kind of I am now. We'll see if that happens, though. Yeah, I feel you on that. It's like we said before, it's just a weird situation where you got to stay ready. And, you know, I also think the UFC really appreciates taking short notice fights. It's almost like a you scratch our back, we'll scratch your type of situation. Um, and you and you always play game. You're always ready. You're always ready to fight. And they appreciate that. So that will pay off regardless of your situation right now. People running from you are scared. Yes. I want to touch on your eye situation because... You know, we, we don't really want to talk about these scary situations that make us realize that we're in a profession that can be taken away from us in an instant. And, you know, even CTE, we don't talk about it. You know, it's just a, a newer sport. There's not a lot of studies that are out. There's for football, but not for us, and especially not on women. So your situation, I know you suffered some kind of eye, eye damage, and you were told that you were never going to fight again. And fucking look at you now. So could yeah. you just kind of briefly tell us that situation? Yeah, of course. So that was in June 2020 when I got, you know, my what was supposed to be my first fight. Finally signed an actual contract with the UFC. It was official. Got down to Vegas. I'm on my last day of weight cutting on Thursday. Well, actually, Wednesday is when I went and got my eye exam. Because for Invicta, you don't have eye exams, right? They say, can you read that line? And if the answer is yes, then you're good to go. Wow. Right? And so... <laughs> UFC had all these medicals I had to do. I did as many as I could in Virginia before I flew out to Vegas since it was so sh such short notice, I think seven days or something like that. And so we're three days out from the fight. They have me booked an eye exam in Vegas because it was the only one they could get me scheduled for um, after I flew out. Go into the doctor and he's he's pretty honest. He was like, hey, I just got out of like ophthalmology school. Um, I see something a little bit funny. And I'm not sure what to diagnose it as. So I'm going to send you to an actual retina specialist. And I was like freaking out a little bit. And I was like, I need to pass this exam. Like write your name on the line. Right. And uh, so many things cross your mind. You're like, do I bribe these people? Like, I feel like I need to bribe these people. Um, and he was like, oh, it's probably not a big deal. It's probably just something genetic. Like somebody your age is not going to have the issue I think I'm seeing. And I was like, what issue? And he's like, I don't know, just something with your retina. I was like, okay. Then he sends me to a retina specialist. I don't get in until the next morning. And I think it's like 8 a.m. Like they just opened, went in there, especially for me. And the UFC called them, set it up, go in. And this lady's looking at my retinas and she's like, you know, making all these sounds. And I'm like, what does that mean? And she basically says, I can't clear you to fight. I'm instantly crying. I'm oh, instantly yeah. upset yeah. because here's my dream, right? And I've gotten there. I, I'm right there and I'm about to touch the tip of it and then boom i can't fight and not only she says that but she kind of like lets the news off as easy as she can but she was like we need to go into emergency surgery for you if you fly back to virginia it's quite likely that you'll be blind and i was like what and she was like well your both your retinas are torn and i was like what does that mean what do you mean both my retinas are torn i can see just fine yeah. And she was like, not if you focus on your periphery, you have your retinas, both of them are torn, but it's in your peripheral vision. And if you fly on a plane, the pressure could cause you to rip them the rest of the way. And you'll basically be blind in both eyes, potentially. And I was like, what? And so they're suggesting I stay in Vegas for three months, get the surgery I need to do, and I definitely won't be fighting again. Um, I will give credit to the UFC. They ended up paying for my surgery. I was very happy, very grateful for that. Good job, but I did end up flying out to Virginia. I just told them I didn't care. Like, I'm not going to be in some strange place where it's expensive to stay around people I don't know. Um, so I was debating either going to Missouri where my family was or back in Virginia where my boyfriend, who we had only been dating two and a half weeks at the time, who is now my husband, was back there and still at school that I was doing and all that. So I decided to go back to Virginia. Um, I think that was June 22nd, something like that. I end up getting my first retina surgery scheduled for July 1st, which is my birthday, um, ironically. And so my dad flies all the way from Missouri, who's not a big person into traveling, right? But he flies all the way out there 
for my birthday slash for my first eye surgery. They do it on my left eye first, then they did the right eye a week later, and my mom came out for that one and took care of me. And it was crazy. I went to four different surgeons to figure out who could actually fix my eyes and who might let me fight again because they were nothing but gloom and doom. I was told by many that I wouldn't be able to do so many things. And this kind of gets into the other side of your uh, show. So by one of them, they told me like, you're not going to be able to do any athletic events because what we have to do is put an air bubble behind your eye to keep your retina patched. And this is a surgery, mind you, that's usually for 80 year olds, right? Like it's for these older people who don't really do physical activity or high strength things. But they're like, you can't do athletic activities. You probably can never be a mother. And if you do, you're going to have to like get the surgery all over again because wow. the pressure of childbirth will like basically make you blind. Yeah. And, you know, just so many things. And I was like, you're telling me I can't even go on a farm and like lift feed sacks. I can't do anything I enjoy doing with my life. And they told me computer screens would be bad for me which is literally my job in school, you know, and this was during COVID. So what else are you supposed to be doing? Yeah. Um, so it was very scary. And we went to, I think our fourth surgeon, uh, Pete drove me there and she met me on a Sunday afternoon in her own office all by herself. And she was like, you know, I've done this on two children before and I can do it on you too. It's an older surgery, but let's get it done. And so like within two days we had the surgery scheduled and now I have two buckles on my eyes like two like these nylon buckles that are sewed onto my eyes to basically wow. keep me good <laughs> that's amazing so I mean I guess the moral of the story is don't listen to the first doctor that uh, yeah tells definitely you. don't get up that but also what you said like fighting can be over in an instant and you already said it good but I always tell everybody if anything it made me not take things for granted yeah. like this can be over and so quickly all it takes is one injury want anything. So enjoy the ride and find other ways to make it. You know, you're doing this podcast. I'm sure you're doing other things too. Um, fighters that unfortunately only have fighting going for them. It can be really not beneficial at all, right? It can, it can hurt them in the long run because they don't have anything else to do if they do get hurt or their career ends. Yeah. I mean, it's so corny, right? But blessing in disguise, I guess, you know, you start, you appreciate the fact that you can fight and you appreciate the fact that you're a smart cookie. You've been going to school for years. Give us some of your accolades. I have it all written down. And, you know, in the intro, I give you all your credit, but I don't want to misquote you. Oh, you're good. So um, I got my undergrad in psychology, sociology, and Drew University. I moved out to Virginia, which is why I trained out there for so long for a PhD program at Old Dominion University um, in industrial psychology ended up just getting my master's. That's a whole nother story, but basically they gave me an ultimatum to choose MMA or school. And I decided obviously MMA. So uh, left the PhD program, getting have my master's. And uh, now I work for Hershey, um, like the chocolate company as oh. a contract statistician um, and do that nearly full time, 25 hours a week. And then uh, obviously train full time and do a lot of other things on the side. I love doing seminars and things of that nature and try to fill my time with that when I don't have a fight scheduled or I'm not in fight camp. I love and, that. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Now I'm in Denver, Colorado training with uh, Team Elevation. Awesome. And that's where um, Alex Hernandez is? Ooh, Alex not sure. I'm you know terrible. That? I'm terrible with a lot of the guys. So uh, the girls kind of train separately from the guys now. So oh, really? um, I don't know like, the top ones like... Uh, you know, Neil Magny and Neil Magny okay, and yeah. Justin Gaethje and oh, a lot of them. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Well, shit. I just had to ask because I know, you know, you, you went to school for quite a while, but it feels like the universe continually is testing your love of mixed martial arts. How bad do you want it? You know, your eyeball situation and now the, the, the master's program and all of that. So way to stick to it. You know, you got to follow your heart, whatever happens. You don't look like you work for Hershey, you know, you look like you work for Gatorade or something, you know, like granola bars. <laughs> uh, so you talked briefly about it. Let's segue right into your romantic situation. I usually ask each guest, how do you identify sex sexually? And then also your current relationships, relationship status that I already know you're married and, you know, straight, I'm assuming. 
So uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, you know, all the mushy stuff. How'd you guys meet? We already know that you were two weeks in and you had a, a retina situation to deal with, which he could have ran, right? He could have been like, too much for me to deal with. This girl's got her issues. She's a fighter, you know, which sometimes scares guy away, guys away in general. So, um, yeah, like this guy must be a great guy. You end up marrying him. He's stuck around. It's actually a pretty good story and pretty wild. Um, so I will go ahead and like tell the whole thing from the beginning. Um, and I do, you know, you said it's a blessing in disguise. I think for my relationship, it also being was a blessing in disguise, um, especially when he chose to basically stick around. I, I called him when I found out about my eyes failing, basically. And this is after I had talked to my dad. It was the first one I talked to just sitting on my bathroom floor in the hotel, just bawling my eyes out for like two hours straight. But I called Pete afterwards, and like I said, we hadn't been dating long at all, like weren't serious in the slightest. And I was like, hey, like, listen, you know, I'm dating to marry, basically, you know, like it's long term for me if I'm dating you. And if you don't want to stick around, I understand because I'm potentially going to go blind, right? I was like, I have no idea. There's high risk of this surgery. There's high risk of everything I'm doing right now. If you want to stick around, please do. Um, but I'm going to be pretty hectic the next couple of weeks. So please ignore anything I say or do for the next little while. If I'm depressed or whatever, you already know that's not who I am. But if you're going to leave, leave now so I don't have to deal with that pain afterwards. Wow, you, you know? gave him an out. I did. Okay. I did. Because uh, you can ask him if he was on the show too. But I've always been very blunt starting relationships, right? And Good. part of it is I'm a professional fighter. You can't. Like people will like you just for status at this point, yeah. right? And so yeah. you have to like draw lines of where that is. Like what's the truth in this relationship and what's you just liking me for who I am in public? Yeah. Um, and I've gone on dates where it's like, oh, this is the pro fighter. And I'll be like, see ya. Like, I'm not doing that game. Like, I don't, you're not going to introduce me by my career to yeah. all your friends. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I don't introduce them by their career. Like uh, pizza, you know, a contractor no yeah. no like that's yeah yeah yeah. yeah so i actually met pete based on basically a bet um kind of silly um, i had a friend i had a friend back in missouri i was complaining to about boys uh, and she was a female friend of mine from the gym that i used to teach years ago and and now we're just friends and she was like well you're the one that doesn't get out and do anything like all you do is put your head in a book and go to the gym and you refuse to date within your own gym so what do you expect mm -hmm. i'm like well i guess and like, my only other... what she you're like touche okay <laughs> yeah, yeah i was like that's fair that's fair and i can't t can't uh date my own students at school so school isn't an option to date within there either because of all the legal grounds even yeah. though they're yeah. my age or older usually mm -hmm. you know i was pretty young going through grad school and um so anyway she was like you need to start online dating and i was like absolutely not and once again status is part of that right i was like yeah. i don't want to be some invicta pro fighter and every guy in my gym or other gyms like see me on there and be like oh miranda's you know free to date because da, da, da. Yeah. i usually kept it pretty close to the vest and uh she was like fine if you get submitted tonight you're starting a online dating profile i'll even start one for you and I was like, all right, fine. I'm not going to get submitted tonight. And I already knew my coach wasn't supposed to be like at the gym and everything. And it, this is my old gym back in Missouri. And I went to visit and here pops in my coach and he's like, Hey, Miranda, how are you? And I was like, what, what the heck? And I'm looking around and she's over there giggling. And I, I swear, like they've never admitted it, but I think it was like all a back a background setup. plan. Setup. Yeah. Set up. And I uh, got on my flight to Virginia. I thought maybe she'd forgotten about it because she hadn't said anything about it. We went to dinner. There was no mention of it. I left and I get a ping on my phone as soon as I hop on the plane. I'm already boarded. And it has a username and a password. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was like, all right, which dating forum is it for? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking she's going to be corny and make fun of me because, I, you know, I grew up on a farm and stuff. So it's going to be like farmersonly.com <laughs> or some nonsense. <laughs> Or maybe Christian mingle, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. like it's Tinder. And I was like, oh. what? no, I was like, that's like the high school hookup app. I was like, did you have to make it that one? <laughs> like, oh, you're fine. Like, it's going to be fine. And I, I eventually like work myself up to it and I just start swiping and I'm like, ew, 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 ew. ew. <laughs> and uh, the crazy thing is Pete was my first and only swipe. 
Really? Uh, yep. And my only match. And I actually messaged him and I was like, you know, something corny, like what's a guy like you doing on an app like this? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it. he like returned it and we started a little conversation. And I think it was the next day or two days later, um, we met on the beach for 30 minutes on May 31st of 2020. And uh, yeah, we started talking and i told him i would have to leave pretty soon i was only going to stay for 30 minutes i bought dinner brought like tropical smoothie to the beach because i didn't want him to have something over me to where he was like well i bought you dinner you know and i was like nope i bought dinner here you go he met me we ended up talking for like three hours on the beach um set up a second date set up a third date went hiking did all kinds of things had to meet my friends to make sure he wasn't you know full of crap yeah because i thought he was a joke like I told my best friend at the time, uh, Heather, um, sh I was like, this guy's going to be a douche, but I promised I'd go on one date from this online dating app. We'll see how it goes, but I already know it's not going to work. Why do you think he was a douche? Okay. <laughs> so so the, the pictures, all right? Okay. Because Tinder, all you got to do is judge visuals, right? You don't have anything else. So it's like, he's a military dude, has a shirtless picture on his profile, <laughs> has a motorcycle, He's as good looking as he is and he's single on Tinder. Like that never adds up to anything great, right? <laughs> and I was like, this guy's all muscular and gym broed out. Like there's no way he's gonna have a huge ego and definitely be intimidated by what I do. Yeah. And it wasn't super obvious what I did on my profile. She had made it a bunch of pretty pictures of me and was just like, I'm looking for a serious relationship and don't ask, yes, I can beat you up. Like that was like, <laughs> what the profile she put was. Um, and he, I met him and he was super introverted, like super introverted. And I was like, this is weird. This is not matching what I imagined, mm -hmm. you know, and super gentlemanly, like grew up homeschooled, which was kind of like in my wheelhouse. Like my siblings were homeschooled, um, super c Christian, like all these things that didn't match up. And I was like, all right. And he was Air Force, not Navy, which in Virginia, it always means a step up, not to insult anyone in the Navy out there, but in the <laughs> dating world, it's kind of a known factor because um, they're always, you know, gone two weeks at a time or a month or a year. And uh, yeah, ended up being, you know, two and a half weeks in, he met my dad who had never met a guy I was dating before. And Pete's only the second guy I ever have dated. My dad didn't know about him. It was okay, you know, but nothing, nothing special. He was like, eh, he doesn't talk very well. You know, the conversation was a little rough, but he seems all right. You know, at least he looks like a man, you know, my dad's yeah. super superficial <laughs> and uh, my mom liked him, but I think she'd like just about any of the guys that I would pick, you know, and, um, it just slowly developed and he proposed to me August of last year. We technically got married on Thanksgiving last year, but we eloped. And we're having our actual wedding October 1st of this year. Amazing. Well, <laughs> exciting for the wedding that already happened. I guess, I don't know, congratulations. But <laughs> so I wanted to backtrack a little bit because when you first started talking, you said, I told Pete, right, his name, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I'm dating to marry. And I'm like, okay, I hear that. And I'm assuming that you were like 23 at the time? 22. 22. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like... Who the hell at 22 years old is dating to marry? And like, you know, I'll let you explain that. But my first thought is, um, it doesn't have to do with your religion at all. And then, kind of like a follow up question: Did you have a check sheet? We 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 all have our own check sheet, right? You know, he's funny, he's educated, he, you know, whatever. Some people, it's like, you know, he, he cool car, you know, whatever your check sheet is, you know, he checks the boxes. So. Uh, explain just like why you wanted to date to marry at such a young age and did Pete check all your boxes at first? Yeah, so um, several different ways to answer that. One, yes, I am a Christian. I I tried to stick to the whole, you know, sex before marriage is bad, all that. Um, I'll be honest that that didn't, you know, work out. And that's part of the reason we got married uh, when we did is like we both kind of felt, I at least felt pretty guilty for uh, my past. and. Um, wanted to just kind of remedy that, you know, and be like, this is the person I want to be with. But at the beginning of dating, it was just, I've seen all these girls already. I'm friends with a lot of older women and mature women. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, at the gym when I was 18, I saw how guys acted and talked around girls when they thought you were a bro, you know, mm -hmm. and I was on mm -hmm. a college wrestling team and I'm like, wow, you guys are 
dicks. Like you guys treat girls <laughs> real bad. Yeah. And you know, not every guy, yeah. but a lot of them, especially the Definitely athletes. college wrestlers. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like these super egotistical, like not to put them all in a category, but in general, yeah. they're some of the more egotistical guys. Like they think they look good, they're big, strong, they're all manly. And I got to hear what they're saying about their girlfriends and all that behind the scenes, like basically locker room talk. And I was like, oh, like, I don't want some guy talking about me that way someday. And I don't want to be just sleeping around for that reason. You know, like the respect that I saw them lack in so many women and for myself and, you know, big daddy's girl, I don't hide that either. And I just think like, what would he want me to do? You yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, that and my religious space. I just always knew like if I wanted to date somebody, then why just date them for fun when I could have fun with them and want to spend my rest of my life with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. Uh, so that's what I kind of started looking for once I decided I wanted to date and I was late to that scene. You know, I waited until I got out of my house and could pay for my own bills before I acted like an adult and sexually, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, when I moved to Virginia is the first time that I ever like, dated it all and started like seeking that out if that makes sense like yeah. being like oh that person's cute let me go on a date with them and mm -hmm. see if i like it and i was always super like i said blunt like i was the girl who went up and asked out the guys i was never shy about that nonsense me like too. Me i probably too. <laughs> asked out the guys more than i agreed to go on dates with guys that asked me out yeah. um and yeah, so that's kind of just how I was started off. And I'd be like, are you willing to move from this location? Because I know I don't want to live in this location. And they'd be like, what? And I'm like, well, just, I'm just serious. Yeah. Like, are you? Get down are you to a brass tax, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, are you a Christian? Because if you're not a Christian, like, from my point of view, all my life values kind of align with my religious values, yeah. right? Yeah. So based on that, um, and you could say what you will, people are like, oh, that's super judgmental. I'm like, no. you can be whatever. But for me to be with me, it's kind of like got a match. That's such a big part of my life. That's who I am. Right. Yes. Just like yes. any value. Maybe you don't like somebody with red hair, you know, like you know, or, me, or me, you know, perfect example. Yeah. You and I are complete opposites, but we're also very similar. Right. You are a Christian. I just know that I couldn't be with someone who had a strong faith, not because I think that there's anything wrong with that. That's just not what I believe. Why are you going to put two puzzle pieces that don't yeah. match together and there's a, a large world out there so like I just asked the the question about like dating to marry because I was confused you know my path you know my journey to love you know with my partner I had we call it the hoe phase you know which traditionally young girls do heartbreak you know uh, fortunately you learned through your female peers at the gym kind of like um, learn through their mistakes right so you yeah. knew what you wanted you followed your faith which is great you know it's like if you know what you want at a young age you know save yourself the heartache and wasting of the time you know start your happy marriage with your significant other early so I'm so happy it's it's really like a, a beautiful love story you know I, I love that that during that hard time of your life you found a partner who aligned with your you know morals and values and spirituality and he didn't judge you based on the crazy profession you have chosen which has happened to me a lot and I don't know how you are, but I always thought I'd have to date somebody in martial arts. I was I, like, there's no way. You know, that's a big question I ask, you know, because I'm always talking to female or male fighters and it's like the pros and cons of dating in the industry. Okay, obviously you share the passion, you know, maybe if they're the same similar weight class, you guys can train together, you know, they understand what you're going through, but then vice versa. It's like, God damn, I don't always want to talk about fighting, you know, I don't, yeah, you know, I don't yeah. always want to see your goddamn face at the gym, you know, I need my own time, you know, I, I just want to focus and sometimes you love someone so much, even if you love your sport, it's like, they're right here, you can't focus and you just need space. So there, there's pros and cons. Um, I can't say anything because I'll be biased. I'm dating a, a jujitsu black belt, but he's not a fighter. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. And that does help. You know, I always thought I'd have to fight somebody or find somebody that was in martial arts. And that's what I had always dated. Pete was my first non martial arts guy. I attempted to date and I thought I would hate it. He literally didn't even know what MMA was. Like I had to explain it to him and be like, this is the, pr and I was surprised because military, like all the things that pointed to who he was, yeah. I thought he'd at least know what it was. 
but his brother knew, but he didn't hardly have any clue, right? And I almost loved it because he learned the journey through me. Yeah. You know, he watched my fights before he watched anybody else's fights. Now he started jujitsu. He comes to my fights and corners me, not to coach me, of course, but like just to be there as a support system. Usually my dad takes that place, but when my dad can't make it, he'll come instead. Yeah. And, um, you know, it ended up working out that way. And I like that I'm able to come home and not have to talk about martial arts. I like that. Also, this is something for me personally, you know, as I guess an independent woman and having a lot of dreams and goals and I'm super ambitious throughout my life, I couldn't have another guy who was also the same level of that. Because if that were the case, it's always a struggle of whose dreams do we follow, right? Who do we agree with this time? And for me, it's more of Pete's the supporting person in my life who's like, yeah, whatever, we'll move there. That's fine. Whatever you need for your career, I'm coming with you instead of vice versa to where if he was like, well, I need to move to England for me, sorry, there's no gyms there. I would be like, oh my goodness, like my career's over now Mm -hmm. Um, to where his is able to move around and it works for both of us. And it it just ended up perfect in that way. Yeah, that's, you're right. And that's a weird thing that we also talk about how this sport is very selfish, right? We have chosen a (laughs) career where if you don't fully commit training, you know, sleep, eating, you know, you ain't going to be successful. And it's not like we're playing volleyball. We were fighting, you know, for, for a lot more than money, you know, for our, our legacy and for our jobs pretty much in, um, you know, family name and whatever it is. Right. Um, but then it's like, for me, like I, I'm my number one, um, attraction to a male is drive and ambition and work ethic. Like, damn, it turns me on. And I think that's kind of like why I end up dating my my boyfriend, my partners, because it's like even seeing them just like sweating and working hard and grinding. It's like I love that value. So it's like I thought I always had to be with someone and I am who has high ambitions and big dreams. And I actually got into a situation over the pandemic where. So I thought I was going to have to move to Texas because he wanted to open a gym there. And I had to ask myself that question, like. You know, if I don't go with him, I'm going to be, you know, saying no to love because I knew I was with someone who I want to be with for the rest of my life. Um, But if I did go, I thought to myself, like, oh, shit, I've got to start all over, find new gyms, you know, massage. I got a massage sponsor here. Just all the little intricacies that really make our fight camps uh, run smooth. And I was just like, damn. And then long story short, we didn't have to move. So I understand what you mean, because when you have a partner who is more of like the supporting role, as opposed to equal ambition and dreams, you don't run into those kind of conflicts. But, um, you know, it's just something I'd rather to have a partner who has ambition and, and, you know, dreams as opposed to some of the other dudes I've dated in the past. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you mean. And so, Pete, when I say that, like. He has separate ones that don't luckily interfere with what I'm doing. Like his jobs, he'd rather work remotely anyway, right? He's a contracting acquisitionist. So he can move anywhere, get any job that's Mm. pretty dang good and do well. And then he does lifting on the side. Like you might've seen him on my Instagram and stuff. Like he looks like an athlete. If he ever comes to my fights, I get jealous because they're always like, dude, what what weight class are you in for this fight? I haven't (laughs) seen you before. And I'm like, like, it's me, I'm the fighter, right? But he looks like a fighter, but just because he lifts and that's like his hobby. Yeah. But luckily it's something to where it's not so serious that he has to move for that, you know, yeah. and that I have to like go to a certain gym. And one of my big things when I started dating is I was trying to buy land connected to my dad's property. I want to live on the family ranch when I get older and decide to have kids. Nice. Um, and so I was like, this person has to be willing to basically move to Missouri if they're not, then they're probably not going to be with me or I'm not going to be very happy at least. Right. I want my kids to have a grandfather and grandmother in their life. And that's, you know, my parents and to be able to have all this land to run on and have this privacy and all that. Yeah. Um, so that was important to me. And that's another reason I decided to get married early on, you know, is I wanted to have kids. I know I want to have kids and I don't want to be at an age to where a lot of risks start coming in, you know, and it's amazing how young you can be that they'll consider you a geriatric mother. I think it's what, 32? Like, it's crazy. Oh, yeah, I, I thought it was 35 because I'm 34. Uh, they changed it. They changed it the oh, last two years, yeah. I think. Wait, make my day. Yeah. Now I'm geriatric. <laughs> I thought I had one more year. <laughs> Maybe you do. You can just live with that. Just, just run with that. 
but I always was like, oh, I want to have these two kids. I better like start early on to where I can at least be done with my career and already have a very established relationship to where I know that's what I want. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, time to mess up basically. Yeah, so yeah. started dating at the time that I knew I should. And I had a couple of relationships that didn't go as planned. Um, luckily not serious enough to, I don't know, give me that sense of heartbreak too much. Like a lot of people go through. Yeah. Um, so that's why I wanted to start so early in dating and married wise. I think it's a maturity thing more than it is an age thing sometimes and different couples do it different ways. Like I learned from my mom and dad, what's too young, you know, they got married when they were 18, 19 and, uh, that didn't work out, you know, like I, I'm still there involved in my life, but um, and my dad, you know, super much and my mom supports too, but they didn't work out. And I was like, yeah, that's probably a little young to be able to decide what you want in life. And at that age, I was just starting college. Who wants to date another freshman in college, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. with them forever. You don't have your life figured out at all. You don't even know who you're going to be. So. Yeah. Well, it, all of that makes sense, you know, and um, that's one of the reasons I love having this podcast because I only have my own life experiences to draw from and then I talk to someone like you who's I'd say pretty opposite end of the spectrum with a lot of things and I'm like oh that is one way you could do it didn't even really think about that but you know you seem like a type a personality just methodical you know and, and tell me if I'm wrong but um oh, very much so <laughs> <laughs> okay and it sounds like you got this timeline of how you want to live your life and not everybody does that but so far you sound on fucking track like you know <laughs> you're gonna finish out your career at whatever age you decide to you're gonna start you know trying to have a baby you'll have the baby you know like good for you um, my question, I guess, would be relating to kids and fighting. When do you want to hang it up? You know, for me personally, I don't want children. I'm 34. I'm like, okay, I'm going to rock it till the wheels fall off. Can't be fighting at 40, but like, I got a few more good years. What kind of uh, a, tip, um, a type A personality timeline do you have going for yourself? Uh, I got it all figured out. <laughs> in my own mind, you know, I like, feel I like am you do. <laughs> Yeah. So I am one of those that has the old granny books that I pull out during the day. Like you told me the podcast was going to be this time. I'm like, check mark. All mm -hmm. right, let me write this time yeah. down in my book. Right. And I schedule every 30 minutes. I also like schedule yearly plans, three year plans, four year plans, 10 year plans. Mm -hmm. And that's something where Pete and I are very opposite. You know, he's <laughs> just like, live the day the best you can and wake up again tomorrow. And I'm like, <laughs> Mm, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> close out and lay them out for the next day, you know, yeah. like that's who I am as a person. So, the same way with kids, and the same way with retirement. And mind you, that could all change based on how much I get a fight. Like, if I'm getting 200, 300 grand a fight, I'm probably not going to hang up the gloves as soon because that's going to mean a lot for my future and the future of my children. Yeah, but you know, if I'm staying, let's say I stay in the top five, 10, then the last, like, you know, the next five, seven years, I'll probably be done at that point. Like, I would say 30 is the latest I want to fight at this point in my own mind. Okay. And I know that's not late. I know that's mm -hmm. not even a long time. But I started when I was 18, um, which a lot of people do. But I feel like I've got so many other opportunities in life that are so much easier in my, on my body. Like right now, and I don't say this to be boastful in any way, but right now if I wanted to quit fighting, I could easily have a six-figure job tomorrow. Yeah. right with my degree and my job history with Hershey and just even in Hershey I could probably just be like hi I'm ready for a full-time job yeah. and, and we call it good I mean right now if I work full-time I'd have a six-figure job so it's one of those things where it'll become a weighing of do I want to keep beating up my body do I want to wait to have kids I already have property and a house waiting for me I already have a loving family I already have my husband who's ready to have kids like okay, time for me to decide what's the most important. I've already achieved the goals that I set out to do in my career. Yeah. And from my outlook, if I haven't achieved what I want to in MMA in the next five, six years, then what the hell am I doing? Like yeah. I've already made it this far right now. I'm already almost ranked. Like surely I can get there by then. If not, I'll be pretty much past what I consider would be my prime anyway for, for when I started, yeah. you know, and maybe not, maybe I'll still be learning hopefully, but yeah, that's something where it just becomes a priority matter in my mind that all makes sense and give yourself more credit not everybody starts at 18 you know that's yeah. badass you know i know it you know i started before you and so um there were even less women at that time i guess you're right like there's definitely 
a younger generation that's starting early on. But you made it to the UFC at a young age, very like pretty fast. And, you know, you're right. You can you could be in the UFC for another five, six, seven years. But you got to think about what we you know circle back to the eye problem, the CTE, you know, like and you're in a really good position, a rare position, I think, where you're not fighting for money. You know, you, yeah, the money is great, but you're not between a rock and a hard place like a lot of your fellow fighters and coworkers are. And there can be pros and cons with that, right? Like literally hungry to fight, you gotta win, like that fire comes out, but then some people don't do well with that type of pressure and anxiety. So that must be nice to not have to worry about that. Yeah, and to tell you the truth, like the whole hunger for it, um, I would almost argue, and this is what I've argued before, it almost makes me fight better because I don't have to go in there with everything on my shoulder thinking if I fail and lose this fight, my whole life is in shambles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, you could say it's a lot of pressure. Some people fight really well under that pressure, but then when you lose, it just goes yeah. with the yeah. confidence, right? It just blows you up. Yeah. So for me, I'm like, I'm going to go out here and risk it off. I'm losing around. I'm going to go, even if I lose the fight, it'll be fine. So why do I care? Freaking go in there and put on a show. Yeah. And so I do, I try to put on exciting fights. Usually the only exciting, non-exciting ones are when I lose, you know? So <laughs> um, unfortunately, like if they hold me or whatever ends up happening, but I think it gives me a freedom to go in there with more aggressiveness and more uh, willingness to put on a show instead of just trying to go in there and not lose. Yeah. And like I said, you know, it, it could go both ways, but I, I think all of us, if all of us fighters could choose, we would choose to be in the position that you're in because, yeah. you know, you just, you adapt, you know, not everybody is as lucky or maybe smart, you know, with their money and, you know, they didn't make all the right choices growing up, but, you know, we do what we can. And, I can't believe it's already getting close to the end of the show time. I have so much more. You're so easy to talk to. Um, but we got to finish off with some fan questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. We got at uh, Shayna Scar 53. What's your routine the night before the fight? And do you have any crazy superstitions before the fight? I do not have any crazy superstitions, really. Um, not like, you know, people are like, I can't see my opponent. I can't do that. Like, I don't have any really. Um, and as far as patterns before fight day, I sleep a lot the day of weigh-ins. Like, I just pass out as soon as I get back to my room and I wake up like every three hours and I eat and drink yep. and make sure <laughs> that I'm completely fueled. You know, my dad makes fun of me. I'll have my alarm going off at like 1 a.m., 4 a.m., 7 a.m. And then... Uh, yeah, I usually have dinner with uh, whoever's there with me, my coaches, my dad, um, and then just pass out that night before, nothing really special. But then morning of the fight, I wake up, do a real quick shakeout, depending on the time of the fight, of course, depends on the time that I train, and then uh, sleep some more, eat a little bit more. And before the fight, I always like do a team prayer with everybody. And for me, that just helps my anxiety. Like from my religious view, I give all my anxiety to God and trust him with anything that I'm not in control of, which, you know, in a fight, we're not in control of everything. <laughs> so you got to just be confident and go in there knowing that you did everything you could to be ready for it. And that's pretty much it. Sometimes I'll read beforehand and I'm one of those people that is super type A. So I always have to find something to keep my mind occupied that yeah. I don't care about. Like yeah. watch a stupid TV show I never watch because I don't care about it or find, you know, you can see my drawing stuff in the back. Like I'll draw sometimes just to like entertain myself, whatever the case may be. Yeah. That, and that, that all that makes sense. I do similar situations, uh, but I love being around all my teammates and I'll go socialize with some of the other fighters, not because it's like time to shoot the shit and socialize, but what's the other choice? Sit in your room and think about the fight, the impending situation. To be fair, I've only fought in COVID environments except once. So oh, I just yeah. go in my room and sit there usually. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Cause you can't really socialize, but oh God, it's so nice to not have that situation. I'm very grateful that we had the opportunity to fight, but fighting at yeah. the apex with nobody there was so weird and i hope i never have to do that you know if if it's no fight at all and that i'll take that but i love yeah. the crowd like it's you know um okay so it's moving on you're so easy to talk to uh at zacky b what is the most oh sorry real quick 
at Zachy B. What is the most sexually appealing characteristic that is in your partner? Huh, sexually appealing. Um, I mean, for me, and this is super superficial of me, you know, but probably just the muscular build. <laughs> He's a big guy and uh, could probably stand on his own if I tried to beat him up, you know, and for me, being you know we're dominant people we're able to do our sport very well and i've never been able to be around somebody that i'm like yeah i could probably just break them in half like a toothpick if i wanted to <laughs> i want to feel safe around that person yeah. so like the size the muscles have always been like something i'm very attracted to yep yep totally agree uh, you know one thing i was going to ask you earlier we got off on a tangent you said something about you get a little jealous when during fight week because he's all like buff and they're like, oh, what, what, you know, who are you fighting? Then it made me think, I'm like, are you a jealous person in general? Let's say it was a girl, you know, like, oh, hey, like, you know, she's flirting with him. Are yeah. you a jealous person? I am. I, I am a jealous person, but it's one of those things where I have enough reasoning and logic to where I never get mad at the girl. Like I would get mad at Pete if he reacted poorly yeah. to it, yeah, you yeah. know? Like it's one thing to be nice and like people will come up to him even prior girlfriends, right? And they'll be flirty, whatever. They'll be like, hey, like, this is my girlfriend, like, chill. <laughs> or if it's somebody who doesn't know, and they're like, wow, you look really good. And he's like, thanks, I appreciate it. It moves on. Like, I don't yeah. care. I don't care at all. Yeah. But if it's like messaging, or like this girl's just getting all over him, and he's kind of you know, yeah. flirty back. I'm like, uh, no, that doesn't <laughs> lie with me. You know, like, I'll tell a little story that he may not want me to. But um, at the beginning of our relationship, he asked me like a couple weeks in, he was like, are we exclusive? And for me and my background, I was like, I looked at you, we're exclusive. That's how that works, you know? <laughs> but in today's day and age and him being military and all that, I was like, okay, that's actually a legitimate question, even though I'm mad about it. But yes, we are like, we've kissed, we're freaking exclusive, right? And he was like, sorry, I didn't know I'm legitimately asking, you know? Aww. And so we've gotten past that, but it's just, you know, those kind of things that you have to communicate. And I was happy that he did instead of just assuming we weren't and doing whatever he wanted. That's you know? exactly what I was going to say. You got a good one, girl, because I would say statistically, most men would be like, she didn't say we're exclusive. You know, so you definitely got a good one. Okay, moving on. Um, Davon underscore DC. What's the transition like from Norfolk, Virginia to Mile High, Colorado? I love it. I love it here in Colorado. Everyone's active. Everybody's energetic. You know, you see people walking, riding bikes, taking their dogs, like, or skiing or whatever the activity is. There's tons of people going to the gym all the time. And so that alone makes me happy because all these motivated people are around you too. Yeah. Um, and then of course, like the beauty here, like there's not a better place on earth hardly that has as much nature here. You can just go out for hikes wherever you want all the time. Um, love that. And also like the people out here are more Midwest style, which is kind of what I grew up in. So I enjoy that too. Like, even though you're in a city, it's almost a country feel if you're not right in the city. Um, plus I'm closer to home. I'm like only 10 hours away from home instead of what, like 26. So that's been nice. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. We got, uh, at Shayla underscore Rayan. How do you deal? How do you and your man deal with being apart so much while you're traveling? A lot of times I bring him with me. So um, other times it is hard on us. Like that's when we have our hardest issues and we'll get in little spats about nothing, right? We'll, I'll be like, I feel lonely even when you're around, you know, whatever the Aww. case may be. And it'll just be like back and forth. Sometimes it's like him feeling like he's not getting enough attention or he's not a priority in my life mm -hmm. because a lot of times, you know, right after my fight, I've been gone a weekend, like five weekends in a row, I think, to teach seminars and stuff. Now, mind you, like I would throw back at him, like you could have came with me, you know, but mm -hmm. you didn't. So, eh. yeah. And so it became just a challenge and especially fight weeks when I'm gone for six days and he's not there six, seven days um, that that becomes hard. But overall, we just get through it and it almost helps once we get back. It's like we want to be around each other even more. Oh, yeah. I feel the same way. Me and my partner <laughs> spent the whole pandemic together and, you know, we just we had a lot of time together and then he ended up getting a job where he was flying to the midwest consistently like you know once or twice a weekend or once or twice a month and i realized i'm like man you literally need time to miss that person you know yeah and, exactly and it just creates a a, a bond for sure pandemic definitely does create like a different scenario though like it, i'm lucky the pandemic happened in terms of my relationship because he probably would never been with me because of my crazy schedule and it gave us time to just i didn't 
didn't have my work and the gym was closed for like two months, the first couple months we were dating. And it just was perfect for yeah. us because we got to spend day in, day out with each other. And by the time things got back in the session, he was kind of used to it and used to my pattern of life, which was nice. Yeah. Most things in life are all about timing and relationships are no different, right? Yeah. I was sure. a fucking wild girl yeah. for a majority of my life. And then as soon as I was like, that's it, I don't want to live my life like that anymore. Yeah. My partner came into my life and I'm like, yeah. literally, literally, if he came in any time before that, it would have not worked out. You know? Yeah. Right. Okay, we got at She Fights 2 Media. If you could avenge only one loss in your MMA career, but avenging this loss will end your opponent's career, ouch, which <laughs> loss would it be? Dang, that's kind of cruel. Mean. I know. Um, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> ooh. I mean, ooh, that's a really hard one. I'm trying to think of my losses. So three out of my four losses have ended their career. So it's kind of like. Ooh, choose one of them because yeah. they're already done, right? Yeah, true. So Samantha Gilliland, I'll just do that because of the way she talked afterwards. Or oh. or Heather Joe Clark. Not Joe Clark. I'm sorry. Not Heather Joe Clark. Um, Heather Walker Leahy. It was like the same dash. Yeah, She's yeah. going to hear that and be like, wow, Miranda. <laughs> you didn't even fight me. No. Uh, Heather Walker Leahy back in D.C., like her and her wife were like on Facebook Live shit talking me, oh, calling me man. every name in the book. I've never even met these people before. We were fighting at 135. I stepped up to fight her. And like, it was a fairly short notice. And I was like trying to come back from a loss. Oh, wait, they said I had to have lost against them. Yeah. Well, well, well never mind. Samantha Gilliland was my amateur loss. It was my only amateur loss. And she ended up saying she was using me as a stepping stone to turn pro. And then she never even turned pro, oh. which kind of frustrated me. And I was like, wow. <laughs> so well, she's actually here in Colorado, which is the crazy part. <laughs> well, look what look everything look at everything you've done with your career so far. So I'd say <laughs> right, right, you won right. realistically. Yeah, I won. yeah right. <laughs> uh, the same same person <laughs> at She Fights Two Media. These people always have the best questions. Yeah. Name your dream dinner immediately after winning a UFC flyweight championship title. Oof. Name my dream what? Dinner. Dream what? Food. Oh. Ooh, after winning that, I can spend whatever money I like. Yeah. Um, I'd probably just go somewhere and literally find like the best ice cream and desserts on the planet. I don't even care about dinner. Maybe nice sushi and then a bunch of chocolate ice cream. Are like, you a chocolate girl? I mean, you work at Hershey, I know. but Yeah, I love ice cream. I love chocolate, <laughs> cookies, all the desserts. Like I could live on desserts if, if I was allowed, but Texas Roadhouse is also like my place to go. So like that too. I'm not surprised by that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Last question for you. Fan question. Same person at She Fights 2 Media. Name three celebrities you would love to switch places with for 48 hours. Oh, wow. Random um, questions, right? They're kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, they are kind of fun. I got to think about some of them. Uh, GSP, it would have been cool to be him. I wonder if we could have switched places like certain times in their life, but like right after when he, he won was, the like, belt. In his prime. Yeah, something like that. Um, let's see, another one. Uh, and I'm just so bad at female celebrities. Probably Ronda Rousey, just because the whole WWE experience. When I was young, she was definitely a role model because, you know, she basically was a pioneer for women's MMA, no yeah. matter. What anybody wants to say bad about her, no. you know, like I may not respect her as a person as much as I do a fighter, but she really started the trend for everything. Yeah. You got to um, give credit where credit is due, regardless of someone's morals or ethics. You know, it's like, exactly. thank you for paving the way. Could it done her, done it a little more nicer and gracefully, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Eh, fuck it. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then I don't know. That's so hard. Can we pick fictional? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right, sure. Wonder Woman. I'd love to have some powers one day, you know? <laughs> Those are I great answers. I try my best to get there on my own, but it's not that easy. <laughs> Those are great answers, girl. And then my last question, I always ask the guest, who would you like to hear next if you could pick um, here on Sex and Violence with Rebel Girl? Hmm. Do, I'd be curious about Kay Hansen, especially now, you know, she's been cut and all that. She's had a lot of changes through her life. Um, you know, I would even, and she can be insulted by this if she wants, but I would venture to say she had more of my like thoughts on relationship and like religious views and conservative views, if you want to say that. Um, and then like had the whole like split with her dad and stuff and kind of 
almost went the other direction, I'd say, you know, all the way down to like OnlyFans and stuff like that. I just like to hear like kind of her views on stuff and like um, where she kind of like changed her realm of thinking and lifestyle. That's a, a really interesting thing to point out. I, I don't know too much about her background, um, but yeah, you're right. Now that I realize it, I'm like, she did kind of make a, at least from the, um, you know, social media perspective, you know, we don't know someone's personal situation, you know, but from the outside looking in, you're right. It, she did, she does seem to have taken a different turn with the way that she represents herself and um, goes about her life. So yeah, thanks for that. That's a good recommendation for sure. So we know yeah. you don't have a fight booked right now. Otherwise, I'd say, you know, don't forget to tune in to Miranda's fight. But, you know, where can we follow you on social media, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever you have? I'm assuming you don't have an OnlyFans. <laughs> no, I don't. But Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, it's all at Fear the Maverick. Um, pretty simple to find me there. I have my own website, fearthemaverick.net. And I'm actually working on strike, uh, setting up my own striking system, Maverick striking system for Ooh. like fitness boxing gyms and stuff like that to take in. Um, so to throw it out there for the very first time, there's good, that. I'm good. On stuff yep. now. Um, and you know, OnlyFans is an interesting topic because I know. They, uh, <laughs> they aren't just what they were like known for back then. Like I know they're sponsoring some guy fighters now mm -hmm. and like, they're asking them to only post like training gear and stuff. And it's like a legitimate sponsorship and stuff. And I'm like, that'd be cool if it, and for me, like if it weren't for the reputation that kind of comes with the, the OnlyFans thing, right. I would be willing to do that. But the second you tell let's say my manager at Hershey, I'm on OnlyFans, they're like, uh. Well, you know, not to promote because they're not paying me, but I have a yeah. similar platform. It's called Fan Time, and it yeah. doesn't have the same adult content stigma. Okay. And you can use it G all the way to triple X, you know, and then yeah. somewhere in between. And so, you know, I've talked to plenty of fighters, males and females about what they have on their platform, how it's helped them, you know, even you, you know, I can see you getting a fan time using it for I'm on the farm, you know, like different, it doesn't even matter. And that's where, like, I would love to do it and put training videos and all kinds of things on yeah. there yeah. I'm about my life that are just not on Instagram or I post separately. But it's just the stigma, right, with OnlyFans. But maybe another one of those is something to look into. In I, I recommend fan time for sure because all it is is exclusive content that you can't find anywhere else. You know, just like you said, okay, Twitter, whatever, you know, but it's just, you know, maybe it's an in intellectual conversation answering all the questions. You got right. so many fan questions. I want to let you know you have a really good, strong, supportive fan base. And, you know, one or two pervs, but that's okay, you know, it's <laughs> compliments. That's so, always the case, right? Yeah. We always got the uh, the mainstream of Middle Eastern, you know, highs on our <laughs> on our messages. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you one last time. This has been a really awesome conversation. I know people are going to be like, where's the sex talk? But you know what? I'm always grateful for my guests coming on because we all have different comfortability levels, right? Of what we're willing to talk about. And you've really opened up about, you know, your physical situation, your your relationship, your, your marriage to your husband, kind of like the pros and cons of dating to marry. My mind is blown. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. And, you know, it's just this is the beautiful thing about podcasting where I can find out about a Christian married 24 year old, you know, me fucking swinger 34 year old over here. <laughs> so well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I have fun. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. I'm looking forward to your next fight. Um, I hope you get that Molly McCann fight just because I think that would be a banger. I really do. You know, and, or, or, or Joanne Calderwin, whatever. Uh, all right. I'll be rooting for you. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Bye, girl. That's it, guys. We are finally getting close to 100 episodes. Um, you know, I, I think I have a guest, but I don't want to jinx myself. It's going to be a good one. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we are talking to Sharissa. The, her nickname is the BKFC Sweetheart Sigala. She's a bare-knuckle boxer who is looking to climb the stacked flyweight rankings. I feel like we've had almost the entire division on. Pearl, Taylor Starling. Yeah, we're going to start matchmaking for bare knuckle FC flyweight division. So uh, we're adding Sharissa to the list. I'm really excited to have her on. She, she really does, personality-wise, seem like a sweetheart, but a badass, you know? So... Um, 
all the fun stuff I want to remind you about, please go check out our website, www.sexviolencewithrebelgirl.com. Buy some merch. When you do, you're automatically entered into our signed UFC glove giveaway. The more merch you buy, the more times you are entered. You can email us always, sexandviolencepodcast at gmail.com for whatever it is, a guest suggestion. Um, if you want to hear more about certain topics, relationships, dating, sex, whatever it is, or if you want to sponsor the show, now would be the time to do it. Thank you guys. A very special thank you to our audio engineer. You can find him on Instagram at DJ Zoll. Uh, Tomorrow Kids Studio, where this is happening, and it's at Tomorrow Kids Official. Our amazing videographer, Judas. Find him at Curious Judas. And again, you can always find myself at Ashley MMA, and the podcast account is at Sex and Violence with Rebel Girl on Instagram. Don't forget to follow our backup account at Sex and Violence with Rebel Girl, number two at the end. That's it, guys. What do I say every week? Be kind, be grateful, but don't take shit from anyone. I'll talk to you guys next week with more tales of sex and violence.